Thank you, George. Thank you, the Navy Hymn. Good morning. Good to see everybody on Memorial Day weekend and also Ascension Sunday here at our church. We're glad that you're here at First United Methodist Church. And want to especially welcome our guest today. If you're visiting with us, maybe you're traveling this weekend. A lot of people moving around this weekend. Uh, so maybe you're visiting here from another place or maybe you're in the community looking for a church home. Whatever the case, we're glad that you're here. Please do what we all do and sign the registration pad. It's the green pad that's on each of you. Uh, members, we ask you to do that too. But if you're one of our guests, please give us a way to get back in touch with you. Maybe your phone number or email address. Uh, and that way we can answer any questions you might have and tell you a little bit more about the activities that we offer here at our church. I want to mention Vacation Bible School this morning. You can feel from the temperature outside that we're getting into summer. Vacation Bible School is a part of that second week of, uh, of uh, June of the 13th through the 17th. And so be in prayer for those families who will be sending children our way. And uh, if you'd like to volunteer, I'm sure Ms. Leslie can use a lot of help, but we'll uh, transform this place into a, a good place for them, a welcoming place where they can hear about the love of Jesus. We well, also welcome those of you joining us by Facebook and by uh, YouTube, Facebook Live and YouTube. Please uh, like and subscribe to us so we can see you every Sunday. But we'd also love for you to join us in person here. We've got plenty of room for you here. We'd love to have you come. We're glad that you're joining us online today. There will be no youth this afternoon because of Memorial Day weekend. The youth have had plenty of activities this week. In fact, uh, they went for a new mission that we're starting here. And your Sunday school class might be challenged to uh, be a part of that in your group. And that is feeding the homeless. We're going to start doing that on Thursdays uh, at noon at the Central Louisiana Coalition for the Homeless. We sent our first meal this past week, but we're going to be needing your help uh, in groups or as individuals to continue that ministry uh, in a, uh, as it is an ongoing ministry. Ms. Jean, you can come and lead us in the family of God, but here's George. Hey, Pastor. <laughs> hey, we want, to, uh, we want to take just a moment this morning to teach, I mean to honor, um, <laughs> Uh, somebody who celebrated a birthday on Friday. And uh, I know that we always do something the first of the month to, to honor everybody, but we're going to double dip this morning, if you don't mind. Uh, Pastor Steve turned, uh, well, we won't give you a number. Turned so one in a hundred. Um, pick your number if you want. But the staff got together and we spent hours trying to plan something. What could we do to. I mean, to honor uh, Pastor Steve this morning. And so, um, as we thought, Jay and Judy kind of said, hey, wouldn't it be fun if we could hit him in the face with a pie? And we, we said, no, we're not going to, we're not going to do that. Um, Let's, she said, I don't care, just give him good. <laughs> um, but most of you know that I am always the voice of reason. <laughs> See? Um, so anyhow, um, those of you who have been here through the morning know that we had cake for Pastor uh, over in the Fellowship Hall, and I believe there's still, there's still cake left. And so before you leave today, if you go over and get your dessert for your meal at lunchtime. But um, let's take a moment this morning and sing happy birthday to Pastor Steve. <laughs>
as we celebrate being a part of the family of God and greet each other this morning.
raised the uh, families of Uvalde, Texas, those before Buffalo, New York, and of course the people, the refugees of Ukraine. So let us pray. Father, we thank you that we can come together as your people, a people of hope, people of light, salt of the earth, the light of the world we are called to be. Sometimes it's difficult, Father, in that darkness to be your light. Father, help us to do that each day as we pray for all of these that have been mentioned today and others who need your healing touch. We thank you for this time when we can come together in worship and come together in sanctuary in the cares of the world. And we can know that you once again love us and that you have a great plan for this world to come again and reign where the sun does and shine. But for now, Lord, we are left to pray, to offer healing, to offer solutions, to be the light of the world, to be your voice, your hand, your feet. Father, show us ways to do that. Empower us through your Holy Spirit that you have given us to make a difference wherever we are. Lord, we thank you for these that are here today. We pray for the many that are traveling today and this weekend. We pray, oh Lord, you will protect them and bring them back to us safely. We pray for those who are sick, for those who need healing. Be with them again, return them to our fellowship. Help us to reach out to them in effective ways. Lord, we thank you that today we'll lift your word once again. We'll give our offerings, we'll pray, we'll dine together <coughs> in fellowship and love with your people. We need this time in our lives to feel your power and your peace. Help us to do it today. Open our lives to hear your word and open our lives to feel your comfort. We pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, how will be done in thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, and as we forgive us our trespasses, we give us our trespasses.
life and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, it's time for our children's moment. This lesson is going to come down. And children, join her here at the steps of the altar. for that freedom. But you know what else we need to talk about today? We need to talk about the greatest freedom that we have, the freedom from sin that we are given. Who gives us that freedom? Who came to the earth and walked on this earth? Jesus. Jesus gave us that freedom. Jesus gave his life so that we could have freedom from sin and death, didn't we? So I have, you know, I always give you a challenge, right? So this, today I'm going to give you two challenges. Do you, you think you can do two challenges this week? Number one, remember to be thankful. When you're praying, remember to give thanks for those who gave their lives so that our country can have freedom. And two, remember to thank God for sending Jesus his only son so that we can have freedom from sin and death and we can have eternal life. You think you can do that for me this week? You think you can do two? I bet you can. All right, let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for the freedom that we enjoy. We are so thankful for those who pay the price for that freedom. But even more importantly, we thank you for the freedom that we have because Jesus is willing to pay the penalty for our sin. Thank you. As Ms. Leslie said, a great price has been paid for our freedom, but a greater price has been paid for our salvation in Jesus Christ. And so we honor that today and we, uh, in obedience to his great sacrifice for us, make sacrifices in our own lives. Sometimes that's our money and the things that we like to buy and we sacrifice in order that we can be faithful in our gifts. Sometimes that's time that we could be using for other things that we give in ministry to others, to reach out, to help a neighbor, to uh, do a, a mission or activity at the church. You can give in many, many different ways. So may God bless your gifts today as we receive our offering. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we have all that we need through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, when we seek your righteousness, all these things, all the things of the world will be added to us as you have promised. And yet, Father, sometimes we try to hoard things. We hold back. Father, give us generous and giving hearts today and in the days to come. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
many of you are aware, but some of you may not be, that on the wall of the hall on this side over near the library, we have a number of plaques uh, honoring people throughout the years who've done various things in our church and served on committees. But among those plaques are the names of those fallen who died during World War II. And so I don't know if you've ever looked at those and prayed for those families, but uh, those remain over there. Tomorrow, May 30th, we remember the many brave men and women who have given their lives to the history of our country to protect us from harm and danger. We remember those also who sustained injury in mind or body in the course of their service for their country. So we salute all of those who served in the military, but especially today and this weekend, we salute those who have given the supreme sacrifice with their lives. So if you'll stand, if you're able, and we'll pray this prayer. I will pray and I will leave this. <clears throat> Gracious God, on this Memorial Day, we pray for those who courageously laid down their lives for the cause of freedom. May the example of their sacrifice inspire in us the selfless love of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, Bless the families of our fallen troops. Fill their homes and their lives with your strength and your peace. In union with people of goodwill of every nation, embolden us to answer the call to work for peace and justice, and thus seek to end violence and conflict around the globe. We ask this through the holy name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated.
Um, got a lot to, uh, a lot of themes today, and uh, Ascension, and uh, Memorial Day weekend, and thank you for the birthday greeting, Lord, thank you for doing that, and those who provided the cake, I appreciate that, too. I'm honored to be here, blessed to be your pastor. So, Memorial Day weekend, we knew that a lot of people were going to be traveling. We, a group of us went out to eat on Friday night in that restaurant, which was normally very busy. It was almost empty, except for us. So I do get a lot of folks on the road right now. People gathered together. This is kind of the unofficial start of the summer for a lot of people. So a lot of them are doing summer things, like going to the beach, and some of them going to the mountains, or going to see relatives. Uh, with the extended weekend. Uh, we also have gatherings post-COVID now, having music festivals. I noticed there was a big one in Orange Beach in, Cal uh, in Florida and one in Austin, Texas and other places. So people are gathering together to celebrate, which reminds me of another large gathering, we think, and that was at the Ascension of Jesus. Now imagine that celebration was very different. They were there worshiping Jesus for the last time before he would ascend into heaven, and uh, one of the places that happened was in Galilee, where he started his ministry. He concludes his earthly ministry there on the mountaintop. We're not sure which one it is, uh, or else we would build shrines and everything else there, but God doesn't tell us that. Just a mountain in, Gal uh, in Galilee, and there they worshiped him and, and saw him. Now, how many people was it? We're not sure. The Gospels don't really tell us. But we have a clue about that because St. Paul later writes about this in 1 Corinthians 15. And he says there, over 500 people saw Jesus alive during these echoes of Easter time after the uh, resurrection when Jesus was with his people for 40 days and nights. And so over 500, well some of them, or maybe all of them may have been in this particular group that we're reading about. So, if you have your Bibles, let's look at the Word of God from Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Uh, and if you're able, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I love the honesty of this passage. It's very honest in telling us that some of them doubted. Yes, there were people that were worshiping there, but some doubted. They, they doubted what they were seeing with their own eyes. Can you, can you relate to that? And to me, it, it helps me to remember how honest the Bible, especially the gospel, is about the early followers of Jesus. Now, some uh, critics of the Bible will say, well, no, this was, this was written years later, maybe centuries later, when the church was ascending and getting stronger there in the Roman Empire. And they made up these Gospels. They made up uh, these stories about these disciples, uh, the founders of the church, to make them look really saintly and to make them look heroic. Well, if they did that, they talk about doubting disciples, would you? No, and so when we read in the Gospels and Jesus is moving around in his ministry, days there in Galilee and in Judea, we read that there were people that, that doubted Jesus, that argued with Jesus, that uh, questioned Jesus constantly. There were people that, that abandoned Jesus, that betrayed him, that denied that they ever knew him. And guess what? These weren't his enemies. These were his closest disciples. All those stories are in there to show how absolutely human these disciples were and how they, all of them, struggled with their faith as well. And yet, the Bible talks about those who doubt as being a part of the believers. 
uh, Paul and and Matthew here doesn't separate these people out and say, well, you have the doubters over here and you have the true believers over here. No, they are all, the doubters and the believers are all called disciples. And when Paul writes about them in 1 Corinthians 15, he calls them all brethren, brothers and sisters. They were all together, whether they had true faith or not. Because anytime we meet in a large group like this and we, we worship Jesus Christ, We'll say some things about him and believe some things about him, like, but there will always be people who are going, I'm not so sure about that. I'm not so sure I buy into that all the way. And the Bible is telling us that's okay to have that journey of faith in your life. It's okay to have those reservations in your life. And especially, I believe, in the United Methodist Church. One reason I love this church is because. But we are a broad path which people can find their faith. We're a broad path. We're not some lockstep denomination all marching, wearing the same haircut, dressing the same clothes, being the same economic bracket and the same political party. We don't insist you vote a certain way, we believe a certain way in order to come and worship and be a part of this congregation. We are a diverse group. And so let me tell you how diverse we are. Did you know that there are 40, right now, 40 United Methodists, proud United Methodists, serving in our United States Congress, in the Senate, and in the House of Representatives? How varied are they in their faith and their political beliefs? Well, let me tell you, John Kennedy, you may know Senator John Kennedy from Louisiana. He is a there are uh, people like, uh, serving like Liz Cheney and Jeff Sessions, who are both United Methodists, two very different kind of Republicans. Elizabeth Warren, though, on the other side of the aisle, is also a United Methodist. And as you probably know, so is George W. Bush and his wife, Laura. They're very faithful United Methodists. And throughout all of our nation's history, We've had Methodists serving in the office, and they are very different in their political views. So don't think we're all one lump sum here. We uh, have very different views. But Matthew does include doubters, those who are not so sure about all of this. One of the things that we're going to discuss and know about in the future is the possible split in the United Methodist Church in the future. And Methodists have always prided themselves in being the big tent congregation, the big tent denomination that includes so many different people with so many different views. But sometimes those views get where they're just difficult to deal with and under the same big tent. A little while ago, we stood and once again said the Apostles' Creed. But do you know that there are Methodist churches, United Methodist churches that refuse to say the Apostles' Creed. Why? Because a lot of them don't believe in a lot of the things in the Apostles' Creed. Many doubt the resurrection. Many doubt the divinity of Christ. Many doubt the fact that Jesus is the only way to God. They believe that there are many paths to God. Many doubt the authority of God's Word and the Scripture as being primary, the primary source of our revelation of God and our way of making decisions about faith. Those, those kind of beliefs are all under the Methodist tent. And so if you think that issues about human sexuality are the only thing that Methodists are arguing about, you're wrong. That is the tip of the iceberg. There is much more to this controversy than just human sexuality and its place in the church. And so we need to pray for our denomination. But we also need to know that the church has always been like that to some extent. They've always been people who went their own paths and had doubts and yet were considered to be believers in Christ. So some doubt. And yet Jesus, even with the doubters and the believers, Jesus gave the same commission to all of the people there. Many of you know this scripture as the Great Commission. Different denominations and different churches and different Christians view Scripture through different lenses. And you'll talk to people. Sometimes I talk to people and it seems like all they talk about is the Old Testament. So they view all Scripture through the lens of the Old Testament. 
Sometimes I talk to people that only believe about and, and, and really want to focus on the sovereignty of God. And so every scripture they read is sort of through the lens of that sovereignty of God. And I grew up in a denomination. They call this great commission the greatest commission for the church and applied to every church and every Christian. Therefore, just about every scripture we read was through this lens of the great commission. What are we doing, therefore, to fulfill this great commission? As a little kid, I memorized this and still say it in the King James by heart. Maybe you can too. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them, you know, the, script, the, the scripture. I can say it because that's the lens we used for everything we did. And so it's important. But I've got to tell you that it reads a little different in the original Greek. It doesn't really say that per se. In fact, it's even stronger in the original Greek. It's an aorist participle. Now, now we know I went to some Greek classes. All right, I know that term. Aorist participle, which means it's properly interpreted. As you are going, baptize. As you are going, make disciples. As you are going, teach. As you are going, do all these things. In other words, it's not just about us sitting here in the comfort of this building and sending people forth to Africa, to Asia, to wherever in the world, go that way, go. It's not just about clergy, people like me going to a particular place and having a particular mission. It is everyone, everyone there, the multitude that were listening, those who had strong faith, those who had doubts, as you are going, make disciples. As you are going, evangelize. Tell people, tell the world about Jesus Christ as you are going. Where is that? As you are going to the grocery store. As you are going to work Tuesday. As you are going to school. As you are going to the book club. As you are going to the gym. As you are going to play golf. Whatever you do, whatever world is yours, the world that you enter into as you are going, then teach all nations, make disciples, baptize, evangelize, tell the world about Jesus Christ in all that you do and all the ways that you do. It is in your attitude, it is in how you treat people, it's in your relationships, it's in your language. As you are going, you're to be doing these things. And that's what Jesus has commanded for us to do. And we know these early disciples, this 500 or so people that Paul talks about, did exactly that because of the spread of the gospel, the growth of the church happened because they took that commandment very seriously, no matter where they were in their stage of faith. I like the words of St. Francis of Assisi. He said, Preach the gospel at all times. Use words if necessary. So he read that in the original Greek too. Preach the gospel at all times. As you are going, you are preaching some kind of gospel. What is it? What is the gospel you're preaching as you are going? But I will say that you have to take it a little beyond use all words as necessary. I think sometimes it is necessary for us to tell the gospel as well. Because we can go out and we can help our neighbors. We can go out and we can be good people and we can, we can, we can be cheery and we can treat people well and we can do a lot of good things. But a lot of times people think, well, that, that's, just, that's just their good nature. That's just their personality. They're just a winning kind of people. A hell fellow well met, you know, someone who everybody likes. That must just be their personality. They were just blessed by that kind of a, a generous, uh, outgoing personality that naturally helps people. They may think that about you as you're going and helping and doing. They may never know that, no, that is not your personality. 
you are not inclined to do those things. That would not naturally occur to you, and that's how most of us are. Most of us are caught up in our own issues, and we don't really have time to go and help others. It is only because of the love of God burning in our hearts. It's only because of the transforming power of the Holy Spirit that we go and help people, that we take time to cook somebody a meal, or we take time to go make a visit, or we make that phone call to that sick person, or we take a neighbor or something that they need, or we help someone move. It is not because we're just good-natured people. It's because God lives in our lives, and we are called to reach out to the lives of others. And so along with our good deeds, along with our blessings to others, let people know why you are blessing their lives because of what Jesus has done for you and what Jesus has done for you, he can do for them. So we need to be intentional, intentional, think that word, about our telling people about Christ. You don't have to be a great preacher. You don't have to memorize the four spiritual laws or some other pathway. You can just tell them your story and say, God changed my life. He can change your life as well. That's as simple as what Jesus is talking about here. As we are going, we are doing that. We are doing good works. We are speaking the word of God. We are teaching. We are helping. But we should know that very well because it's really in our DNA as Methodists, isn't it? You know anything about the Methodist history, you will know that John and Charles Wesley, when they were going around from fields and preaching, having great successes, when they, they were in factories and foundries and other places where people gathered, as they did that, people would come down forward and, and would accept Jesus Christ in their lives. What a wonderful thing. They would do what Jesus did here, talked about here, but it's baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They would get them into the kingdom of God. But here's the thing. In the 17th century or 18th century England, there were a lot of preachers doing that. Church back then was not being successful, but evangelists were being successful. There were people like George Whitfield who did that and other great speakers. So the Wesleys were not alone. So what made the Methodist successful? What grew into a great denomination and a great movement? It wasn't just the preaching. Yes, that was part of it. It wasn't just Charles Wesley's beautiful music and the hymns that he wrote. That was part of it. But the other part of it, more important probably, was that the Wesleys did not just leave those people and go to the next town to do the same thing over and again. They would set up with those people what they called bands and classes. They would draw together small covenant groups of people and appoint and train leaders. And those leaders would help those little groups, kind of like Sunday school classes today, kind of like our service organizations today. Small groups that would come together and pray for one another and keep each other accountable for the things of God. They were bands and classes that would meet together and they would nurture one another in their growth of the Lord. They would teach all things whatsoever I have commanded you. They would do that part of the Great Commission. And therefore, the Methodist movement flourished. It didn't just hit a town and then go to the next town and whatever was done there was sort of forgotten. No, they continued in that nurturing spirit. And that's who we are, folks. If you don't have a small group, whether it's a Sunday school class or a covenant group or a missions group or whatever, you need to find one. You need to get into there and grow in your faith. It's part of who we are. It's God's plan for redemption of the world. In 1951, there was an engineer at Mercedes Benz, the car company. I can't pronounce his name or tell it to you. But he was a brilliant engineer, but he was also very distressed because cars in 1951 were becoming much more powerful, much faster, much larger, and he saw that death rates and, and serious injury rates were climbing worldwide with automobiles. 
it distressed him, but as an engineer, he figured out something that would help to save lives. You may have heard of it, it's called the crumple zone, especially in steering wheels, where if you were hit from the front, the steering wheel doesn't go through you as it used to. It crumples, it collapses upon itself. Mercedes-Benz invented that, and they patented, patented that as a safety feature. And it was hugely successful. The numbers of, of deaths from Mercedes-Benz plummeted after this was introduced into their car models. Well, other manufacturers looked around and said, well, we got, we've got to have that too. And even though it was patented by Mercedes-Benz, they never, ever enforced that patent. They never sold that to anyone else. They allowed all the other car manufacturers to copy their patent free. So later, a salesperson of the company was asked, why did y'all miss this opportunity? You could have made millions of dollars charging other companies for this patent, this life-saving feature. And the spokesperson for Mercedes-Benz said, some things are worth giving away. Some things are so important, they are worth giving away. Folks, that should be on our tape to our mirror every morning as we're getting ready to go out into our worlds. Some things are so important, they are worth giving away. And you and I as God's people, redeemed by His grace, forgiven by His love, sharing an eternal life with Him, and that is too important to not be given away. That's what Jesus calls us to do joyfully every day. As you are going, make disciples. As you are going, Tell others, help them have what you have it is worth giving away. We pray with you. Father, we thank you that you entrusted us with this great commission to go and as we're going to be a part of people's lives and their transformation to be the people you want them to be. Help us to do that every day. Help us to take this seriously, and as we are going, Father, to bring the love and grace of Jesus to others. Father, we pray that you will help us in our doubts. Lord, you help those who doubted you in the Bible. You showed them what they needed to see. So, Father, when we doubt you, we pray that you will overcome that through your love for us. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. We're going to have a time of commitment here as we sing a hymn. And as we're singing, this is your time. It's a time when you're invited to come forward. If you'd like to just spend a moment with God here in the front. We have a wonderful place for you to do that. Maybe you just need to unburden your heart to God, or maybe you would like to make a recommitment to take Jesus with you as you are going. You know the impact that you can have on someone's life. Or maybe you've never committed your life to Christ in the first place. You've never asked and trusted Jesus with your heart. If you'd like to make that first step of that journey, I'd like to help you do that this morning. So we shall stand and sing freely, freely, number 389. As you make your decision.
now send us forth into those places you have called us to minister, to talk, to speak, to give, to help. Lord, wherever that is, help us to go in your grace and your love, empowered by your Holy Spirit, to make a difference in this world. In Christ, I pray. Thank you.